We are in Revelation, the 13th chapter. And uh, we are going to start in just a few moments with verse, t or start in verse 11 as we look at the second beast. Um, before doing so, I wanted to come back to verse 12, um, and Mike asked a question that I said that I'd spent some time looking into and didn't have a, a very good answer, and I, I still don't um, know that I have a great answer, uh, but I did spend some more time going back and looking at that. Um, it's one of those statements that it seems like all the commentators are just skip over, uh, which I find the more difficult things in scripture, that's typically what happens. Um, but as I looked at that, and the question was, and we we're talking about Satan being thrown down out of heaven. In 1212, we read, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows his time is short. And the question was on, what does it mean that the time was short? He knows his time was short. Before we address that, for review, because this is important going into the second half of this chapter we're going to look at, what have I suggested the heavens relate to here? Who, what group of people? God and the church. The church, yes. Kevin says God and the church. Um, uh, and typically, heaven means God and his, his dwelling place, right? Um, and when we see that Satan's been cast out of heaven here, um, I, I believe that what we see is, I, I suggest, is that the God's people have been moved from a physical realm into a spiritual. Therefore, out of the direct impact or out of the direct um, reach of Satan. Because the church, the kingdom, is a spiritual realm now. Uh, so Satan is not able to impact it the same way. He's, he's got to go about it in different ways. Uh, so what does the earth or the land represent? Israel. Israel. And the sea? <clears throat> Gentiles. Gentiles. Um, and most noteworthily, um, you know, the Rome, but the Gentiles as a whole. So we are saying rejoice church and you who dwell in them or who, you who are in it. But woe to you Israel and the Gentile nations for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. Now, how is his time short? It's been 2,000 years and Satan is still around, right? He's still working. He's still doing his evil deeds. I believe 13, as I read over this a, a number of times, may help us with this. And when the dragon, who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. When the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male. But the woman was giving the two wings of great eagles so she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is nourished for a time and times and time and a half for three and a half years uh, as we get <coughs> there half of seven. I believe it's possible that Satan realized that he was defeated. And he made a concerted effort to stop the church while she was in her infancy. Had he been able to stop the church out and stop her in her early days, he could have gained a foothold, if not victory, right? What happens if on earth the entire church ceases to exist on earth? Right now. What happens? Yeah, what would happen if that if that were to take place? Would, evil would rule the world. Okay, certainly There'd evil be no would be straight. Humans would be evil. 
Genesis 6, right? God will destroy it. Just like Genesis 6. Yeah. Their, it, their imaginations were only evil continually. There would be no restraint. No restraint. Bob? I, I think that would be the judgment day then. God will take care of the rest of the earth and, and depart. Those that are with Christ and with God will stay in heaven. The rest of the world will be destroyed. Okay. And, you know, I can't argue with any of these things. You know, up to this point, time was kept in eternity. There was no end of time. So now if the devil is cast down, when Jesus comes back, it's over for him. He's lost. The church is one with him. So comparing if it's 2,000, 3,000 years, the devil's on his last chance. Time Absolutely. has got shorter on him now. Because now he's not looking at eternity. He's looking at the time. And it says Jesus will come as a thief in the night. And with God at years as a day or so forth. So maybe looking at the time issue of eternity, time <coughs> is on a short leash. Yeah, that's certainly true, isn't it? And that, that's something that I had not thought of in that way because the shorts are used elsewhere in Scripture. Um, you know, it, it, these things are about to happen. It's the same terminology. But comparatively speaking, he's been, Satan's been living throughout time. And, and now he understands that with this defeat, the defeat of the kingdom, that it... His, the handwriting's on the wall, right? So, great, great point that I hadn't thought of. What did the early church not have? This is what I was getting at. If all the members of the church that were alive ceased, the church, the church, or let me define it better. I think in this case, the kingdom still exists, <coughs> right? Exists in heavenly realms. So, if all earthly members cease or die, what do we still have that the early church did not have? The word. The word. The, word, the seed. Right? And that is something that Satan did not. Once the written word was established, the seed was there. In fact, there's centuries where the church is so minute that it's almost impossible to find in history, right? Throughout the Dark Ages. And yet she, spurred, she comes roaring back because, as Jerry says, uh, the seed, the word, um, is present. So I don't know if that helps. It's certainly not definite. Dad had, I think, some great thoughts on it. Um, it very different than the direction I was going. Um, but um, there's some possibilities on, on what that time being short is. All right, so we say then this beast comes out of, where does this first beast come out of? The sea. What's the sea represent? Gentiles. The Gentiles. So I believe that this first beast is uh, Rome. And so this beast is ravishing the earth and causing everyone to worship who? Satan. Satan, yeah. It, what did Jesus say? You're either for me, you're against me. Right? So they set themselves, the emperors do, up as gods. Um, they are going to prevent people from worshiping um, uh, true, the true God. And so... Um, this is that this is Rome and in having influence over all of the known world at that time. We ended with this statement. Here's a call for endurance and faith to the saints. The call for endurance and faith was these words, verse nine and ten. If anyone has it here, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Or um, I think King James is a little clear here. Those who take captive will be led captivity. And those who slay with the sword will be slain by the sword. 
God, I believe, is saying, I'm still in control. This beast, remember, was said, um, verse 4, who can stand against them? Don't worry. You might feel helpless against them, but this beast is going to be taken care of. Questions or comments? All right, then let's continue on um, with this, this second beast. Um, we'll read the whole thing and then come back and, and so we have the context and then we'll look at verse by verse. Then I saw another beast risen out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, it spoke like a dragon, it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or, or the forehead. So no one can buy or sell unless he is that has the mark that is in the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For is a number of a man, and his number is 666. All right, so the second beast comes out of the earth, which represents Israel. So uh, this is, I believe, apostate Israel, um, the second beast. Notice two things, the first two descriptions of the beast. It has two horns like a lamb, and it speaks like a dragon. The two horns like a lamb, I believe, is religious power. Um, we had all over, and we're staying on Sunday mornings about the tabernacle and all the furniture, we have horns of a ram all over in all the religious um, implements. Uh, and it stands for power. In this case, not just power, but I believe religious power. Uh, but yet it speaks like a dragon. Um, I believe we have here the political power. This beast in such was the case with Israel. She claimed religious power and she claimed political power and she was a strong peace but there was something about this beast she only exercised her power where verse 12 exercises all the authority of what the first beast which is Rome. Uh, the exercises all of the authority of the first beast in her presence or on, most literally, on her behalf. So she has power, but where is that power coming from? <clears throat> Satan? Satan? You're getting right to the core of it because Satan's behind the first beast, right? The second beast power is coming from the first beast, from the beast of the sea. Right? And Mike's spot on, though. We've seen that Satan, or the great dragon, is behind that first beast as well. So the second beast, Israel, performs power in the presence of Rome or as being allowed by Rome. When she wanted to execute our Lord and Savior, <clears throat> whose permission did she need? Rome. Rome. Yep. Um, to do any of these things, she has to go back to Rome. Uh, she's powerful. She doesn't have to worry about outside invasions. Because of who? 
Rome, right? Um, so she it relies on that power and makes the earth or the land, Israel, and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Did Israel make her people worship Rome? Some head shaking no. Head shaking yes. We've got division in the church. <laughs> in a way, yes. Uh, because, you could say because um, at one time the Pharisees said that they had no king besides Caesar. Caesar, Caesar. Yeah, that's, that's before Pilate, right? right. A, a Christ's um, trial. Think about how God uses Pilate to say Shall I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting that Herod the Great, right in Caesarea, built a tremendous temple to worship, I believe it was Tiberius. Christian, not sure. He, he was Googling me last week. And I said, you're going to be Googling me and giving me input after class. You have to give it to me during class. Um, but uh, there, Herod the Great builds a temple to worship one of the emperors, as I'm recalling it's Tiberius. Um, and they end up rolling. As they go forward, they use Rome to persecute the church. So they are causing these people to follow after the first beast. 13, it, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven on earth in front of the people. Now, how does Israel perform great signs? When you're contemplating that, turn back to Matthew 24th chapter. We're going to look at verse 24. This is Jesus' words concerning destruction. Jerusalem. Verse 24, Matthew 24 reads, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform. Are you there? What is that, Shirley? Great signs and wonders. Great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. The reason I bring this up is when we think about signs and wonders, we think, and especially in Sunday nights, we're studying about the book of Acts. We're thinking about the signs and wonders that those apostles are doing, which were true power, right? But don't forget, we didn't get to Simon um, last Sunday night, so we didn't make it the whole way through the lesson, but Lord willing, not this Sunday night, Dave Newberry's coming <coughs> with us, but following Sunday night, we will... Uh, see Simon the uh, sorcerer had the people fooled by doing signs and wonders. Right? Israel claimed to be God. They were able to crucify the very Son of God. Now you don't think that's a sign of power, a sign of wonder. Look who I am. Corey, if you knocked Mike Tyson out, do you think that would be evidence that you were pretty mighty? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Right? They knocked the Son of God out. So I don't believe these signs are, they were, notice 14, they were allowed to work in the presence of the beast. Um, these signs. Um, 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it was allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives all those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Remember in the seven letters to the churches in the beginning of this book, God, Jesus himself, refers to the Jewish people as the synagogue of... Remember? Satan, right? 
Um, and I believe he's getting at this same idea by causing them to bow down to the beast. Um, they are causing them, in an essence, to worship that beast. Um, by the way, Willie made a statement last night that struck me, and uh, I, I think it's true. Part of this, I, I won't. I won't say with certainty the first part of what he said, but the first part he said was America will never be great again. Take or leave that. But I think his conclusion was reasonable. He said because what made America great is people trusted in God. Mm -hmm. And now people want to trust in America. And for as long as people trust in America, she will never be great. That part is absolutely true. Trust in God to make America great. God, trust in God. If America trusts in God, she'll be fine. Yeah. I say that to say, back in November, we did a study, I did a lesson, two lessons on, uh, on politics. And the first lesson was look at the politics of their day. So many were trusting in Rome. Think of the high priest says, we've got to, after the, the resurrection, uh, the raising of Lazarus, the high priest says, it's good for one man to die instead of a whole nation. He's saying, if we let Lazarus live, then everyone's going to follow after this man and Rome is going to come down and defeat us and take our power away, essentially, is what he's saying. Where's their trust? It's in Rome. That's the high priest. I used as an illustration to, um, to point out how they are worshiping that first beast. They're putting their trust uh, in that beast. Uh, go ahead. A couple questions. Um, Back in 12, uh, chapter verse, verse 12, um, it says at the end there, whose moral wound was healed. Did, we t did you talk about that? Yes, um, I did. It won't hurt to remind of that. I, I think there's two strong possibilities. Um, in short, Julius Caesar takes Rome from a republic to a, um, to a, what say, dictatorship. Empire, uh, right? And uh, he is killed for it. The Senate rebels, uh, and and Julius is is killed um, by Brutus. And so it goes back to a republic for a short while, and then comes back. That's one possibility that the emperorship almost dies, but yet it heals from that wound. I personally think that has to do with Nero. When he dies in around <laughs> 67 AD, Rome collapses. Um, in fact, historians felt it was certain that Rome was done for. And yet, um, she's able to recur, re revive. Uh, Vespasian revives her, if you will. And I believe that's what it refers to. Okay. So it's, a, it's a, another way of describing Rome. Okay. And then in uh, 14, let me see here. 14 at the end, was wounded by the sword and yet lived. That's referring to the same wound, okay. to the beast that was wounded. Okay. Uh, we saw earlier one of the heads is actually wounded. Just doesn't say which head. <coughs> Um, okay, so we see the mark here. Um, in the mark, we have two marks. Uh, one for God, one for the people of these beasts. Um, these, uh, these people, uh, these marks represent who you serve. Um, and I believe it's strong in Old Testament imagery where the priest actually wore the name of God on their foreheads, right? 
uh, the Israelite people were told forever to keep God's law before their eyes. So the Pharisees literally write verses and put them before their foreheads. Um, and so we have those who are sealed by God and those who are not sealed by God are marked by the beast. Um, 18. He says, calculate, and we'll end with this. We're, we're a minute or two over. Um, and you can ask questions on it next week. Um, if you add uh, the Rome, Rome and a lot of old nations used letters to, um, to, for numbers. What, do, do you ever notice my outlines, my PowerPoints always have numbers? Where are the numbers I use for primary points? <laughs> Roman numerals. Um, they, they had values to them. You may have a footnote that some manuscripts um, have 616 for the number of the beast. And you have a, a footnote for that? That is true. Some manuscripts say 616. Now we have a small difference like that. Usually we count it to a scribing error, right? Here's what's interesting. When you add up the value of the letters of Neron Caesar, it equals 666. Neron was his actual name. If you add up the values for Nero, which is what we commonly call Caesar, what do you think it comes to? 616. Um, that difference in manuscripts, I think, is additional uh, evidence that um, whoever was scribing it knew the context of what they were writing down. Um, I'm sure there's questions on that, so we'll uh, write them down, think about them, study them, and next week we'll attempt to deal with those before moving on. Thank you.